Hello and welcome to Exploring Media Theory Week 2. This is the pre-recorded lecture. This week we're going to be looking at theories of mass communication in middle modernity. Before I go on with the lecture, I just want to talk about these presentations for a moment. I noticed last week when I was reviewing the lecture that the visual image of me that you can see somewhere down in your right hand screen there seemed to be slightly out of sync. So my words were reaching you before the representation of me was reaching you. I do apologise for this, it's a slight glitch with the technology that I'm using and I hope to get it sorted in the next few weeks. So please do bear with me. Um, the image of me, lovely as it is, isn't really that important. What's more important is the kind of words you'll see on the screen and the hopefully the things that I'm going to be saying about it. So I do apologise about that. Okay, so this week we're going to be talking about theories of mass communication in middle modernity. And the aims of this lecture are really threefold. Firstly, I want to kind of outline to you some key theories of media and communication within, early, within middle modernity. To place them in the context of middle modernity, to kind of explain to you what we mean by modernity, I'll do that in just a moment, and then to offer some critical evaluation of the three theories. So by the end of this lecture, you should have be able to roughly explain what those three theories are, realise how they fit together within middle modernity, and to kind of offer some critical understanding of them. So modernity, well, it's an interesting term. It's used very, very widely within the humanities, the arts, and the social sciences. And it has many different meanings. There's two main ones. Um, what we're going to look at today is we're going to use modernity to try and describe a period of time. And it's used to describe a period of time from around 1500 to our current era. And it's usually subdivided into different areas. So we have the period of early modernity, which is from around 1500 to around 1750. And this is following the Renaissance period, which was the rebirth and rediscovery of scientific methods. And it was in this period that the main foundations for the modern world were established. So you can look back there and you can almost see the antecedents to the kind of functions and structures we have in contemporary society. From around 1750 to about 1950, it's a period of time that's often termed middle modernity. And here, modernity and society take on many of the shapes and forms that we know today. The big structures that we understand of governance, of education, of thinking about the world, were established during this period. And it was in this period that we had the emergence of science as we know it today. So we had a period of time called Enlightenment, when modern sciences were invented, and a number of other disciplines come out of this period. Now, from around 17, sorry, from about 1950 or 1970 onwards, we get to a period often termed late modernity. And here, you witness an acceleration of the kind of phenomena of modernity. And some people turn to refer to this as post-modernity, saying that modernity is finished and instead we've moved on to another era. Other theorists, and myself included in this latter category, say, well, we don't think modernity is actually finished. Instead, we think the kind of phenomena that you would get today are a continuation of those phenomena of modernity. So we call it a period of late modernity. Now, one of the big things is the people and societies are very different from pre-modernity to modernity. The ways in which society functioned, the ways in which we worked, the ways in which we thought, our name forms of relationships, our forms of faith and understanding of the world, quite different. In fact, some theorists uh, argue that we actually think differently and think differently about ourselves in these two periods. In pre-modernity, we have one way of thinking, and in modernity, we have other ways. And this lecture is not really the place to go into that too much, but it is a fascinating topic. And over the course of this series of lectures, we'll be broaching this in a number of different ways. Now, one of the key things is the mass media were an absolutely key component in middle modernity onwards. And it really helped to accelerate and drive forward many of the changes of modernity. So together with the other big features of modernity, such as mass education, and a few of us I'll talk about in a moment, the mass media play a huge part in how we understand and experience the world, both from middle modernity right through to today. 
Now, what we're going to look at today is I'm going to look at three broad theories. We're going to look at first at something called theories of mass society. And they really emerged from about the 1880s and were dominant through to around the 1940s, 1950s. There's another set of theories called structural functionalism from around the 1930s to around the 1970s and then pluralism from about the 1950s to the 1970s. Now this is a very rough periodization um, and of course these different theories overlapped and the times aren't precise. It wasn't so like they were suddenly discovered and invented these theories and spread very very quickly. Um, so the rough under the dates are quite rough and not very specific but it'll give you a, a, a broad understanding and of course the, the different theories overlapped one another. So I want to turn to the context of this period of time called Middle Modernity. Now I said a moment ago it really begins around 1750 and runs through to around 1950-1970. Well what we're going to kind of refine it a little bit more and here I really want to talk about the latter part of the 19th century. So from about 1850 to 1870 onwards until about 1950 or 1970. Now during this period um, the societies that are encountering modernity and that's primarily those in Western Europe, in North America, in um, Australasia and a number of other parts of the world. They changed quite dramatically and there's a number of features, I'm only going to focus on four here, but there are many other features that are occurring. So firstly, they, were, they underwent a period of industrialization. So here, the ways in which people manufactured things changed quite dramatically. In pre-modernity and early modernity, the normal ways in which you would acquire the things you needed to live would be to either make them themselves or buy handcrafted goods. So if you wanted a pot or a pan, you would go to someone who made pot or pans and they would make one individually for you. If you wanted a knife, you would have an, an individual knife manufactured for you by a blacksmith or so on. Now, as science advances and technology advances over the 18th and 19th centuries, um, ways of mass production emerged and they set up large factories and to serve the factories you had coal mines and mills and so on. And so we had large parts of the population moving away from working on the land towards working in industrial settings. So people became, their, their labour was changed from an agrarian form of labour to an industrial form of labour, and this is termed as industrialisation. Now accompanying industrialisation of course, people had to move to live near the factories. So you had a depopulation of rural settings. The multitude of villages gradually thinned out, towns and cities became much larger. And it was around this time, around the 19, you know, 1900s, that it had the, the emergence of enormous cities such as Liverpool and Manchester and London and Birmingham and several other ones across the UK. And they drew in millions of people from the surrounding areas and put them in these places. Also around this time, people's beliefs began to change. Um, there wasn't the same engagement in religious practice as there had been previously. We always had to rise of science as a, an alternative form of belief system, but gradually people became more secular in their belief systems. Furthermore, there was the rise of what we might term bureaucratization, the, the emergence of large systems of administration. So you had many more censuses taking place. I think if you try and trace your family tree, the earliest census you can usually find is 1811 in the UK. Before that, the people recorded information in parish records, but there was no central government system. From 1811 onwards, there was government censuses across the UK. There was records of people, people's work, there was all sorts of things going on. People started recording information, and bureaucracies grew up. Mass education systems emerged in the middle of the 19th century. So all these kind of things, the ways in which we know about the world, were written down much more. Now those four things, industrialization, urbanization, secularization, bureaucratization, and a number of other things, resulted in a change in the way in which we experience the world. So you ended up with systems of mass production. So as before, things were handcrafted in an individual. In a modern era, the goods that were used in our modern lives tend to be mass produced. So my wonderful shirt here, which I bought from Edinburgh Woolen Mill, is part of a mass production system. Very few people today wear handcrafted items. 
there's mass housing because there's smaller individual houses that typified life in the pre-modern era and so people move from villages up into larger towns so you would get rows upon rows of houses you'd have terraced houses large estates were established in the middle of the 20th century we had the emergence of tower blocks and ways in which you can cram more and more people into a smaller place and accompanying these things people started buying similar goods this ties in with the mass production so you have mass consumerism and you witness this more and more as the period goes on people buying similar goods you'd have brands emerging for particular goods and standardized goods going on there now all these changes were quite important and very significant people did notice them going on so you had lots of commentators and writers in the late 19th century trying to understand what was going on. They could see the transformation of their society that they were living in. Now, I'm going to focus here on a number of group, and they came up with a theory called Mass Society. And these authors, such as Matthew Arnold, Ian Foster, Tia Selit, and a number of others, were both impressed and amazed by the transformation in their society, but also equally horrified. They found that the new society was quite traumatic, quite different, and quite difficult to live in in some ways. People were living in these new urban industrial societies, and they saw quite a big difference between the agrarian-based lifestyles that people had had, maybe 50 or 100 years before, and the new urban communities. And they were arguing that rural life was based on small, tight-knit communities with strong links, People lived in a community where they knew everybody there, they had obligations to them, um, and friendships, and all sorts of things, and they worked together in these small communities. And that's perhaps a rather rose-tinted impression of small communities. But these guys thought that the small communities worked well, they brought people together and so on. Urban life was quite different. Here, people lived together, but with little commonality. They came from different parts of the country, uh, they had little in common and they had a lack of links between them. And they described urban life as anomic. An enemy is a kind of way in which we live when society doesn't provide the guidance to individuals. It doesn't give us the kind of social rules and social norms that we need to live by comfortably with other people. So if you say a society is um, anomic, it means we're more, more atom-like rather than community-based and we don't tend to think of ourselves as part of communities and we, it's more about self-interest and these guys didn't like that they, they were quite against this approach and also a number of sociologists were writing in this time and you did find the founding fathers and establishers of sociology all tried to deal with this great big topic one of them was a guy called Ferdinand Tonnes and he was a German sociologist and he, he kind of offered a bipart model of this. So he said in more traditional societies, in the agrarian societies, he termed these Gemeinschaft, he termed these as communities and he had loose links between people, uh, people could move around within these societies but they knew where they were. When you move to a more formal sort of like, when you move to a more society based model such as people living in cities with larger systems of bureaucracy and administration, you have more formal links between people but you lose out those informal links when you've got um, it becomes more bureaucratic and more contractual your relationships with other people now the critics I mentioned Arnold Foster and Elliot were quite saddened by this loss and they lamented the loss of a fo you know a former period of time when people were more affable they so believed now people in anomic societies were vulnerable to commercial and media manipulation and this was one of the big fears of the middle of the 20th century and this is one of the explanations of why so many people in Germany turned towards fascism and it's because they were manipulated by the media and what you had not so much in Germany but one of the big fears was that indigenous culture the culture of our families and of our ancestors and so on as we moved to a city we lost that and instead we ended up living in this kind of grey world and instead of our own indigenous culture the kind of folk arts that our, us and our ancestors had lived with for hundreds of years we tended to sort of like you know buy into a, a mass manufactured culture primarily produced by the USA 
And those three theorists I mentioned a moment ago, um, Arnold, Foster and Elliot, were all quite worried about the impact of foreign American culture upon more traditional British ways of life. And they also feared it would affect our kind of like higher levels of culture and the very nature of British civilization. And they were particularly concerned about how new technologies were mediating and bringing in this foreign culture. So from around 1890, cinema started to come out. In the 1920s, we had radio. Now, television, although it was invented in 1928, it didn't really achieve a mass audience until about the 1940s and 1950s. But these technologies, newspapers before them, they, they had a fear that American culture was seeping in and it was polluting British culture. So underpinning all these kind of approaches here, this mass society theory, there's an idea that audiences are somehow vulnerable to mass communication. You've got very powerful media technologies that are present in our lives and they're able to manipulate ideas and opinion. And if we're not cautious, we'll lose track of our own more traditional indigenous culture to this mass communication theory. And you, to this mass communication. And you can see um, kind of echoes of mass society theory all the way today. You have constantly this fear of American culture, of alien culture coming in and taking away our own indigenous culture. So it still goes on this approach. It's not completely forgotten, but it has lost traction to a certain degree. Well, it has a lot actually from about 1940s. So moving on to our second theory, this is a more optimistic interpretation of the mass media. And this is from a group of theorists who tended to be called structural functionalists. And I look at two guys here. There's one guy called Lewis Worth and another one called Harold Laswell. And they were both writing about the US in the 1930s and 1940s. Now at that time the US was, was a fairly new country really. I mean it was, although it was founded in the 18th century, 17 something, about 86 or something, uh, 1792. So it was still being formed, it was still developing and still pushing forwards. Now one of the main things about the US is it, although there was an indigenous people in the United States, the uh, Native American Indians, um, the vast majority of people who were living there were migrants from other cultures. So had large numbers of Italians, of Russians, of French, of English, of Scots, of all sorts of people were moving into the US. And one of the problems was they weren't, although they were all living there, they weren't mixing. They tended to live in very sort of like discrete pockets. And they tended to think of themselves, not so much as Americans first and foremost, but they tend to think of themselves as Italian Americans. Irish Americans or English Americans and being quite distinct so there's different ethnic groups that didn't integrate terribly well. Moreover these groups are scattered across the USA and it's a vast country so there are pockets of people all over the place. Now on top of this there was an enormous depression in the 1930s. The stock market collapsed in 1928-1929. There's some vast amounts of poverty in the US, uh, lots of civil unrest and so on. So there's a big problem of anime, uh, a lack of social solidarity to different groups were integrating, they didn't think of themselves as American, and then there's poverty laid on top of this thing. And when you get poverty plus anime, you get some real problems. So the solution to this problem, proposed by Worth, was that you could use mass communication to somehow bind people together with an American culture. So the new technologies of mass communication could forge a new consensus, a new way of thinking about themselves as Americans. You could use the mass media to disseminate American values. And through the education system and the other systems, the mass media would allow Americans to start thinking themselves primarily as an American individual. So they began to work out ways of doing this. And the mass media, um, I think the last one came with this great quote, was a hammer and anvil social solidarity. We could use the mass media to bring people together to try forward a new idea. So again we're getting another key assumption here which is the power of the media to influence. So the media can change the way in which people think and change the way in which ideas of society can come about. Here's a quote from Worth. 
There are detached masses that are held together, if at all, by the mass media of communication. We need a degree of consensus capable of mobilizing the energies of members or at least neutralizing their opposition and apathy. Sorry about that, a man has decided to cut the grass outside my office. So he's still doing it, so I might stop again in a minute. But anyway, so that quote there was by Lewis Worth, and that's 1914. Have a look at the second reading for week three on that one. Okay, now we also need to talk about the idea of conflict and consensus. For the, while functionalism seeks to explain how society works and it remains stable, um, it is a theory that's grappled with the idea of conflict as well. Um, so functionalism today is a, is a kind of theory that looks at a society and tries to understand how that society functions. In many ways, this sort of society is in a similar way to you might look at a, a motor engine. Um, you might say the carburetor does this and. Uh, different parts, I don't know anything about cars, but the carburetor does this and the pistons do that, and it would explain the function of that, looking at the total output of the engine. They weren't concerned about whether there was any inequalities going on in there, they were just concerned about whether the society functions or not, and how it could keep going. So they were often accused of ignoring, or maybe even legitimising, inequalities in society. And functionists were often accused of ignoring sources of social conflict occurring in society and just looking at the total picture. Worth, however, does acknowledge um, there were forms of tension in the 1930s and 1940s. And moreover, as we said a moment ago, when you've got a period of poverty or a period of uh, social financial problems, the issue of anime becomes much more evident. Um, and people complain a lot more that their leaders are out of touch. So this is a little bit like the Brexit thing, although you've got the decisions made by those people in London and we're all, you know, those people were sort of very cosmopolitan and metropolitan, the people in the northeast of England felt excluded from those decisions and that's one of the reasons why Brexit was thought to have occurred. So the kind of theories that about anime and things that were going on in the 1930s do still have resonance today. Now, one of the ways in which the functionists understood mass media is that they saw the mass media as a form of nervous system, as a way in which the elites in society, those in charge, could understand what was going on about things. The media could serve as sentinels or maybe devices to alert the powerful that there were issues of social conflict going on and with those, with the awareness of such issues, they could work on a way of driving forward better levels of consensus. So for function, stability is important, and it is perhaps more important to them than issues of social justice. So Worth was arguing that the process of securing consensus, and he was a quote here, is always partial and developing, and it has to be one. You've got to keep a society together to keep it going. And he even came up with his lovely phrase, the engineering of public assent is one of the great arts. So they saw Keeping people on side, keeping an idea going is very, very important. And public relations play a huge part in this. So public relations on behalf of the government were about legitimising certain political decisions to keep stability. So therefore you end up with the media attacking what we might term anti-systemic or groups that were opposed to the government. Um, they would attack striking movements, they would attack anti-war movements in periods of, of war attacked feminists, they attacked civil rights, and they would seek to preserve the status quo, because for a functionalist, society must be kept going. So, function, to give you a brief summary of that, it's a classic modernist perspective. It's concerned with progress. There's a structural emphasis, um, they're very much about looking at the needs of the social system, looking at society as a whole, and what does society need to do to keep going forwards. There's a power of the mass media is assumed, that the mass media can change things. But for some functionists, like Worth, they acknowledged that there had to be a continual struggle for consensus. It's an ongoing thing that you need to do. And this is very similar to the position of some neo-Marxists, which we'll talk about in week four and week five. 
There are also a few issues that are worth identified with the economic ownership of the media. Who should have the right to set these parameters to, to direct society in this way? Okay, there's another theorist, he's called C. Wright Mills, and he's a bit like a functionist, but he brought more pessimistic approach by using a functional, functionalist form of analysis. He offers a more critical functional account. Now, Mills was very, was very interested in how power groups retain their power in society, not just for a period of time, but across generations. And he tried to explain how the media contribute to a small group retaining power of generations in a democracy. Because in a democracy, you shouldn't be able to retain power. You should be able to vote for a new leader whenever you want one. But when you look at the political classes in America at that time, it was the same families that were retaining power. So he was very interested in how this functioned. So he looked at lots of systems that did this. He looked at you know, the forms of education, how money was passed on in various bits. Um, and he argued that it's also facilitated by the function of media in mass societies. Media have this function of opinion making, that's the advertising and the PR industries. And this permits the military and political and economic elites to preserve their power. So it stops people challenging the systems as they are. And he argued that mass opinion is organised and delivered by certain powerful groups in society. Now interestingly, the very groups that do this may not even be aware they are the elite. And he said they do consider themselves as normal. So there's a great quote from Trump here, and he says, I consider myself to be in a certain way to be a blue collar worker. Of course, Trump is the son of a multimillionaire who passed on the money to him. And Trump's children are going to inherit the money there. They're not normal workers. But the way in which they bash themselves as normal workers both has an overt political communication thing, but it also reveals something about how they actually see themselves. They see themselves as normal people and present themselves as normal people. Now, I want to move on to the third group of theorists, and this is termed liberal pluralism. Um, so in the 1950s, the US was, having, was part of the Cold War, and in the US there's a, a, a very strong fear of the Soviet Union and of China. And of course the Soviet Union was a, uh, you know, it was trying to disseminate it, its political agenda of communism and it funded lots of movements in other countries. And so the US also funded movements in other countries and in itself. And it wanted to articulate a political narrative. Um, so US academics felt the need to demonstrate the superiority of their form of democracy as opposed to communism or socialism. And it does tend to pluralism. And pluralism builds on that functionist view of the media communicating between institutions. So essentially pluralism is the underlying political philosophy behind mainstream politics in the USA. It's a system by which the US believes itself to function. So we're very concerned with the idea of what is a good society, where would be a good place to live. One of the key aspects of this is rather than having a centralised system of power, as you would in a communist system, where you have the state, and it's actually termed the state in communist systems, um, controlling everything and all decisions being made there, under a pluralist system there are multiple centres of power in a society. And the mass media has a vital role of this, and it has three main functions in a political, in a pluralist political system. Firstly, it's to hold the powerful to account, to be the public watchdog, to police the politicians, to make sure the politicians aren't corrupt. And this idea dates back to the middle of the 19th century in the UK, with the idea that the media are the fourth estate. So as well as the executive and the legislature, and the, uh, sorry, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary, which are the three wings of power, there's a fourth group of power, which is the media, and they keep an eye on the government, making sure it's doing what it does. A second view is um, it, the media ensure there's a plurality of views in circulation, that there are competing views, there's competing ideas. So although you, you might have one, you know, there might be the mass media out there, but they're meant to offer many different opinions on the road of government. And thirdly, they represent public views to the political elites. 
they can you know show the political elites what people are thinking and the role of the media is to articulate what normal people think so the political elites can understand them now this was viewed to be a superior system to one party states where the state controls the media and these would be in communist socialist and fascist systems so pluralism is all about having different groups in society vying for power competing with each other the role of the media is to facilitate that competition and that's quite distinct from the communist system where there was only one government that believed it had a monopoly on the correct way of doing things so liberal pluralism um, so social holds the view that social progress and individual freedom are the goals uh, for a society and they are achieved through rational argument so democracy is based on the idea that we will talk about things we will come up with the best possible solution and we get to vote as individuals we can choose who we want to do it and we can have these debates about things so you can have a great big argument about something but it's not a violent argument and we solve our conflicts through debate rather than through violence and the role of the mass media in that is the mass media is where those debates take place so you're looking at the mass media you can see different opinions if you watch television programs about political debate you have people from different sides arguing about it and that is to facilitate open forms of conflict without actual violence and then we can see which argument we agree with most and then vote in that way now one of the things is this is a structural perspective um, but it is it's it's looking at society as a whole but it's looking at the competing institutions within society so you might be looking at the um, ways in which uh, businesses argue their case versus trade unions argue their case and all sorts of other debates now um, Wilbur Schramm uh, he, his argument was that the media hold a powerful account and offer those pressure groups an opportunity to actually get their voice and the pressure groups also hold the media to account as well so the media hold the government to account and then the pressure groups hold the media to account now uh, being a bit more critical about this so let's turn to a kind of critical evaluation things now although very different political values each theory of mass communication uh, they shared certain things so firstly each theory is very much offering a macro approach they were looking at society at a large level and if you remember back to last week we talked about how the different theories are going to look at worked at different levels so you had macro level theories meso level theories and micro level theories these three are very much focused on the macro and they're looking at society as a whole um, there's a definite preoccupation with the mass media in relation to building social consensus and how they resolve social conflict. So all are interested in how society maintains the equilibrium. The theories assume um, a form of structural determinism that social structures existing in society impact upon us as individuals and cause us to behave in a certain way so structures such as the media they shape behavior and the media can change the culture and beliefs of society now for the mass society theorists that was a bad thing because they didn't see the media as reflecting the indigenous beliefs for the functionists they saw it as a way in which the media could bring together America together and for the pluralists they saw media having a very important function in society affording a democratic process but all of these things these the media are out there and they can affect us uh, so media and mass communication and technologies of communication affect behavior and can change society and culture now all these things of course also reflect the rise of mass production the rise of mass markets and mass advertising and they're all trying to explain these phenomena going on all three also offer, work quite in a quite linear way of communication so it's a top down model so who says what to whom with what effect was a, a, an idea put forward by laswell 
Okay, so the information comes from the centre and it goes out to the people there. And one of the criticisms, this is quite a simplistic way of looking at how the media function. And later on in the course, we're going to come across some more counter positions. So this didn't work quite that way. And in fact, it's possible to get different readings of the same message. There's also what we term a modernist belief in knowledge contributing to progress. This is part of this, um, an understanding that we're going to be covering across the course, how within modernity we believe in progress and we believe that the more information we give people, the better decisions they have. And you need to look at that in many different ways because if you give people information in one particular format, they can only come up with one solution. But these are kind of some of the ideas that will come across later in the course. But there is this belief within all these positions that the media can be used to drive forward certain agenda. So when we come around to doing the seminar, there's a couple of issues I'd like you to consider. And when you're doing your reading, I want you to have a look at these issues, please. So first off, there's a, when you've done your reading, have a look at the preoccupation with macro issues and with ideas and consensus and conflict. Um, I want you to think about the assumptions about power and influence of the media over the audience does it have that power? Does it change the way in which we think? Um, is there conflicting models going on? If we get conflicting information, what do we do with it? We've also got ideas of linear models of communication coming from the centre. Is that the way it still works or does it work differently today with digital media? And finally, changes in social structure and society since the mid 20th century. Well, things have changed very much. Do these models still work today? or do the changes that we've encountered in what we might term late modernity kind of well, disprove these earlier models. Well, that's it for this one. I hope you've enjoyed the lecture. Um, thank you very much.